Hello, everyone. Welcome to day one. Today is Foundations Day of Prep for Wave Week. Uh, super excited to have you here. This may be your first video or your last video of the day since there's three of them. Um, but Foundations Day, really how I kind of geared it up is really to get you one in the right mindset. And then two, starting to like really think about like before we get into operations and marketing and sales later on this week, what are some of the foundational elements of your travel business that you need to look at? And that's when I thought I should bring in my good friend, Steph from Host Agency Reviews because they do an annual survey. So based on those survey results, what are kind of like some of the trends that you should keep an eye out on? and maybe like strategize for your wave season plan. So without further ado, hi, Steph. Hello, Rita. So happy to be here. Yay. I'm so happy to see you. So um, also, if you you obviously don't know because I didn't record uh, prior to this, but we've already been talking for half an hour, so we are nice and warmed up, ready to go. <laughs> Although we don't need warming up. Rita and I just right. like jump right into life, so... <laughs> So, um, I guess before like we get into like survey results, so who was surveyed, how many people were surveyed, where do they come from and all that? I don't know where they come from Rita, but <laughs> <laughs> from they, some, they end up on the parents. survey somehow and they take it. <laughs> um, but let's see, I think this year we had over 2000 advisors take it. Nice. And the way we always look at things at HAR, um, is there's, Within the travel agency distribution channel, there's like kind of chunks that have nuances within them that they operate differently, um, even if it's not that different. So we always break it out into hosted advisors, which are ones okay. who have a host agency. And for those that don't know, that means you're booking underneath one accreditation number, but it's a bunch of independent contractors at independent contracted agencies. Mm -hmm. So we have a hosted advisor report, and that's the vast majority of survey respondents. And then we have independently accredited, which means it's just you underneath your own accreditation number. Um, and then we do one for employees. So people that are not independent contractors, but actually employed by a travel agency. Um, and obviously that one covers a little bit more information. So when you take the survey, uh, we worked with the the state of Minnesota, uh, I don't know what his title would be like, he helped makes their surveys. Okay. And so we hired him on as a consultant to switch us over to the survey program and get us set up a few years ago. And he was like, you have the most complicated survey I have ever run across. Um, really? Yeah. So like when people take it, there's just a lot of conditional logic in it. Because mm -hmm. if you're hosted, we want to ask you specific questions within there. And then if you ask, like, and if you're an employee, we want you to uh, answer different questions. And then we also right. want to make sure we catch outliers. So say, for instance, you know, like if someone's saying that they have $100,000 in sales and that their commissions are $200,000, well, that's something's wrong there. Uh -huh. So there's all sorts of like errors that pop up that are automated and, and things like that um, through the years that we've like refined it. But he was like, this is an insane survey and I was like <laughs> really well, they, and then I was also kind of like what have you been doing at the state of Minnesota that's in funny. your surveys <laughs> so yeah, that's that's kind of very the goal spooky. yeah the, the goal is to kind of break it out into these three chunks and then look at information for each of them so like big picture things we look at we like to look at the incomes that people are making mm -hmm. um Fee charging is a big thing that we look at. Uh, we look at demographic information. We look at tech stacks, what tools they're using within their agency, how happy people are. Um, mm -hmm. Every year we ask a really random fun, we call it the fun question, but sometimes they're really weird. It'll be like, <laughs> I, I think one year it was like, which would be your favorite office pet? And it's like a singing rock, mm -hmm. a like bearded That's dragon. Funny. Like it's weird. So <laughs> I wonder, I'm trying to think what this year's was, but anyways, <laughs> um, so, uh, initially I have, I have a couple questions from the things that you just mentioned, but what would you say is your most surprising finding from the survey from this past year? Um, 
Let's see. I, well, so one of the neat things was because it's it's been a little funny the last couple of years because of the pandemic. So mm-hmm. our report that just came out this year is still from 2022 data because we're just gathering that. So we're like, okay. it's like a year behind okay. um, in some aspects. So it's still affected a little bit by the pandemic. But what was kind of neat about it is that 68% of hosted advisors, because right now we only have data from hosted advisors, um, although the rest of the reports will be coming out very, very shortly. Mm -hmm. Um, But 68% of them were full-time in 2022, and that surpassed what we saw before the pandemic when it was only 63% worked full-time. Oh, wow. So there's, yeah, so that was kind I mean, it's a huge jump, number one, but it's also partially still, people were still last year recovering from the pandemic. So the fact that 68% were working full-time mm-hmm. is pretty cool. Yeah. Now kind of like thinking about the beefiness, do you also go into detail as to what full-time means? Like how many hours? Yes, we do. So we consider full-time over 30 hours a week. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Or it's 30 or 32. I can't remember exactly. Okay. I wonder if there should be like a category that says it's like over 70 or 60. We, well, we do that. have, really? we do have that too. Yeah. We have okay. it broken down. Yeah. And so um, there are some people that are working those I <laughs> and I try to discourage it. So like on the, the answers, it'll be like, like 40, 40 plus hours a week. And then it's, I think, I don't know if it's like 60 or something. I can't remember, but we're like, that's a lot. And I, I want to be like, you should rethink your work-life balance. <laughs> For reals. All right. Going to fees. I think there was a recent, and I don't know if it was your survey, but somebody recently said that uh, tr- 50% of travel advisors are now charging professional fees. Is that your, is that your it, number? It likely, it likely is because that's okay. what ours are. So, okay. uh, um, so this is one of the nuances that you'll find between a hosted advisor and an independent is independent are more likely to charge fees mm-hmm. than their hosted counterparts. Um, and there's a lot of factors that come into that because independent advisors typically have more experience. And what we know from the results and like looking at the survey is as you have more years of experience, you're more likely as a general rule to charge a fee. And so that makes sense. But it's yeah, it's 49 percent of hosted advisors are charging some type of fee. So a service fee or a consultation fee. Okay, well, that's good to know. And that's interesting to 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 distinguish the difference between independent and hosted. Mm -hmm. And also that it makes sense that the independent would charge more fees because I feel like independents are usually more advanced in their field. They're not starting out like a lot of newbie travel advisors and going into with the host agency model. Yeah. And so this is preliminary data because we haven't finalized our um, report yet, but I've been going through it this last week on independents. And I think it's... um, let me see. It's something, well, you know what? I'm not going to say it because I don't know for sure if this is going to be, if, if this is going to be actual data. So uh-huh. never mind. <laughs> Forget about it. <laughs> Forget about it, everybody. Um, I know a big topic of, uh, I guess, contention-ish was also how much travel advisors were making. I think I had recently seen in like one of the Facebook groups that they're like, how can I like afford to go full time if I think the number that was given was 38,000 was the average income. What were you kind of seeing as as far as the survey results this time? So there's one thing we do because when you're looking at data, depending on which way you're looking at it, you mm-hmm. can get a lot of different answers. So when we're talking about income, we have, say, just the average or the median income. Mm-hmm. But that's going to vary drastically if it's a part-time person versus full-time. Or that's going to vary depending on what niche you're on. Or that's going to vary. Mm-hmm. Like another big thing that comes into play, too, is if people charge fees. They earn about 20% more if they're charging fees right. than someone that doesn't. And so, um, and it also is going to depend on what, how new they are 
so we there's a whole section of the report on income trends. And so we break down the numbers within there. So let me just pull this up really quick. So okay. um, let's see. So like, we'll break it down by income, by hours in your experience level. So like years three through five, um, you know, you're making $45,000 on average if you're mm-hmm. full-time. Um, but that jumps all the way up to like 65,000 at years nine to 11. And so it's for people that are newer and saying, how am I ever supposed to go full time if I'm make, only going to be making 35000 Well, number one, if you're still working somewhere else, all that energy could be going towards your business. Right. But, but also, like we always tell people and what we see in the data is that it's really years three through five when people end up going full time, mm-hmm. if they're going to go full time, because that's when it's you've got enough of a base that you can live off that probably Mm -hmm. um, $40,000. And then all that extra energy you're putting into it is going to help you reach that next threshold where you're going to actually be able to make a living off of it and not scrape by. Right. Right. I also plugging in a little free tool that I have the lead generation calculator. I think a lot of people like just put numbers out like, oh, I need to be making this. I need to be making that without actually figuring out what they really need to be making. And so that's kind of like what the calculator does is take all your personal expenses and business expenses and Mm -hmm. spits out the number that you should be looking towards. So I think a lot of times when people are like, that's not enough, I'm like, but is it? Have you like really done an inventory of that? Yeah, because I so I'm looking at our report. And so if you're full time versus part time, and this is for experienced advisors, which means we consider that with three or more years experience, Mm -hmm. um, the part timers are making twenty one thousand dollars. a year. Okay. And the full timers are making $60,000 a year. So there's a huge difference when you jump from part time to full time, right. no matter which way you slice and dice it. So I think for people that are worried about that jump, you just have to know and believe. And what can help you is looking at data. Mm-hmm. Um, that once you make that leap, the income is going to come like right now, mm-hmm. you've just kind of capped yourself out. Yeah, I also think about kind of going tying into like the fee question is if you're looking to make more income, especially now that we're kind of reviewing everything, what can you do within your business that's going to increase the income that you do make? So is this having a larger number of bookings? Is this increasing your planning fee? Is this working with more premium vendors? Like there's so many different tweaks. Is this even just increasing your conversion rate? Like instead of 80%, you get to 90%. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's a lot of those things. So it's, you know, putting in more hours if you're part-time, mm-hmm. it's charging a fee. Um, it's focusing your niche on an area. So for instance, Disney has, I think we've been doing the survey like seven years, always last for the the average Mm. income. Yeah. I shouldn't say always last. It's very low on there versus Uh things like luxury are continually on the top up there. And so like using all of this information you can find in the report to be like, all right, how can I maximize my income here? Um, And there's a lot of like, I've never seen a report this thorough and in depth. Um, Like, I mean, it's 70 pages and (laughs) <laughs> like I read them multiple, multiple times. Um, and like, you know, I'll read like focus, right. Which is known as like a research agency and their report yeah. on travel agencies is like nine pages and it doesn't have a ton of like, it has info in there, but it's nothing that, um, yeah, it's, it's just very, very different from the HAR reports and the information because, but I think it's because we're, we're, in that day-to-day with travel advisors Mm -hmm. and so intimately familiar with it. Like I have all these questions. I'm super curious. Um, And so anytime we have a question on something, like say for instance, on online booking engines and like how many advisors actually have online booking engines on their website. And um, so then we ask that question and then we 
the reason I want to know is because so many new advisors think they need an online booking engine on their website. Mm. And so then I wanted data to be able to say, like, no, actually only whatever, 20% of advisors have an online booking engine on their site. And of those that do, like 70% don't ever get a booking from them. And the 30% that do, they get between one and five bookings. So is that worth the whole front page real estate right. of your website? Oh, so, I, I mean, that. that's what's fun is just anytime I have a question or someone on the team has a question, we can be like, oh, you know, there's nowhere in the industry that covers that. Let's ask that in our survey. Yeah, I really loved when you said like how happy people are. So what are some of the stats on those, like the mood, the emotional level? People love their jobs. Um, yeah. As a general rule, um, they love their jobs. They would do the same niches again if they had the choice. The one thing that people aren't satisfied with, even though the majority are, is the income levels. So okay, 70% of advisors feel like they're fairly compensated, or I think it's 69%. So they feel fairly compensated. And then of the ones that don't feel like they're compensated fairly, like they feel mm -hmm. like they deserve a raise, then we ask, how much of a raise do you feel like you deserve? And it's 20% is what the biggest majority said was like, we need 20% more to feel satisfied, which coincidentally, Rita, is how much more you can earn if you charge fees. I That's why I made the face. I'm like, I think that's a professional fee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, I was like, it's a sign. <laughs> I, I love too, where they like super specific on the, on the 20%. It's, yeah, it's, it's also... actually 11 to 25%, but we just say 20% uh -huh. because it's kind of in the middle, but. Yeah. So for those, I'm trying to think outside of professional fees, because like host agencies really don't have too much to do with that. But like, what are some thoughts or maybe some things that came out from the survey as to like where people think that they could earn more income? Or how, um, how can host agencies affect that? How can they affect the income? So one of the things we kind of look at too, we ask in the hosted advisor report specifically, is we kind of ask some information on what their commission splits with their host agencies are. And what we're looking for there is the average commission split. And we compare that between new advisors, which are when you're zero, one, and two years in, mm -hmm. and then the experienced ones, which are three plus on. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's 70% is the average commission split. So you're getting 70% for a new advisor. Yeah. And then I think it's 80 or 80, I think it's 80% is the average for the experienced advisors. So that's something here. Yeah, it's 80%. And okay. then we look at, we also look at the um, interquartile range, which is, uh, let's see Sounds how to explain fancy. this. Yeah, you can call it the IQ range. Um <laughs> <laughs> but essentially the IQ range is like when you're looking at the whole data set, I mean, really it's that 25 to 75% where the big chunk of most people are going to be. So that's mm -hmm. what the interquartile range is, is it's that whatever that 25% number is and that 75%. So when we look at the commission split range, what we're looking at for new advisors, um, that 25 to 75% of people are usually between the 70 and 80% commission split. Um, mm -hmm. And that raises up to, for experienced advisors, they're looking at 75% is going to be the low end for most experienced advisors. Yeah. And 90% is going to be the top end for the majority of experienced advisors. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when somebody had said to me that they were only like making 50 or 60%. And I was like, wait, what? Like, how can you be making that? And I know like there's so many different business models, but I was like, I feel like yeah. 70 should be the bear. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, they, I often see when there are, there's first of all, most host agencies start at 70%. Right. When I see people that are doing the 50 and 60%, um, usually it's because it includes like this mentoring program and really hands-on uh, or it's because they're giving leads and yes. the leads are taking that big of a chunk. 
right all the marketing that they they've okay. done um what else is on this well what else was a happiness fa- or unhappiness factor outside of income that was that was pretty much it like um they the thing that you know we also ask like what is hardest for you as a like what's the most challenging part of your job mm-hmm. um like the challenges and for most people it's finding clients or or dealing with difficult clients um mm. so and and that's really neat because it used to be one of the things that we have on there is competing with online travel agencies and that continually used to be at the top or towards the top and mm-hmm. this year i think it was at the very bottom for the challenges which is huge nice. yeah so nice. good for the self esteem that i'm like ooh i feel like um it's just come to the forefront the value of using a travel professional mhm and so I talked about, of obviously we were recording this before October 23rd when it goes live, but uh, I had talked to you about a podcast episode that I wanted to record and that's going out in real time tomorrow mm-hmm. <laughs> um, about you're using AI and it shows. And one of the discussions <laughs> that I had in that was you know, if people wanted to go to a computer, they would have gone through an OTA, an online travel agency. They would not have gone to a person to plan it. So if it is evident that you are kind of reproducing something that a computer has already spat out, where is the value in that for somebody who was looking for a personal approach and discernment in their planning? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you know what, too, is interesting, I guess. So this survey, we did it April through the end of June. And uh-huh. I guess like AI was big then, but it um, but, you know, we it didn't have strange. anyone. Yeah, that I bet like that'll be in our challenges next year. But I was just realizing that wasn't in the challenges. And that is something that's on the mind of travel advisors. Yeah. Yeah. No, Um. I'm glad that you kind of like brought that up too, because it seems like, yeah, and the second half of the year is I think when the talk of will AI take it's over so much <laughs> in the past nine months, it's insane. And I think it's so brilliant in how the, like people are using it and like the tools that they're coming up with yeah. just to help make lives easier. I don't think it replaces things per se but it helps us do like things faster and not with as much brain capacity as before which is nice Mm -hmm. yeah well it's nice to I mean I use it for stupid stuff sometimes I was telling someone the other day like I'll be like hey can you print me out all the Fridays in this format for 2024 in a CSV and so I can just copy and paste it and put it in there instead of, mm-hmm. you know, before I would have tried to look up how to do an Excel uh, formula to figure it out. And it would have taken me a really long time or I would have had to copy and paste it somewhere and then like yeah. erase everything I didn't want. And so, I mean, it feels like my little assistant sometimes. I feel pretty fancy. That's that's what I said. I'm like, AI is your virtual, virtual assistant. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Was there anything in the survey kind of like about marketing or marketing trends? Not really. Um, no, not really. We okay. we talked about, um, I think like the only place it, it would have come up would have been, um, we asked them if somebody um, changes host agencies. So like, that's one of the things we're kind of curious about too is, the kind of the course people take because it's not abnormal to change host agencies and I know that most people that do it it, they do it earlier on in their career and that's Mm -hmm. anecdotal but I feel very strongly that I would even I I would feel very comfortable saying that even without the data behind it and um, so then we were kind of curious okay well how far in are people usually changing and is it their first year is it nine years in so this year Mm -hmm. we looked at it and um, you know about two-thirds a little under two-thirds of people that end up switching host agencies they're doing it within their first three years of business Um, 
And then we ask them, you know, why are you leaving host agencies? Oh, I like that. And one of the things, so we, we kind of put them in buckets because uh, it's, they can choose things, but then there's also fill in. So we, we did these big buckets um, and like one of the things, so about half of them will say that it was due to lack of support. And within there, one of the smaller containers is kind of the, would be like the marketing tools and technology okay. tools, training and education, that sort of thing. Oh, that's so fascinating. Because I, I know, Rita, this data is so delicious. <laughs> I And it's specifically like the tools, but then it makes me also think like, well, if you wanted that, then you, it's, it's always like you have to sacrifice something to get something else because you could get that if you were franchised, but you have bigger fees. You could get that yeah. if you like went with a host agency that provides leads, but then you get less commissions and all that. So it's like a give or take. Um, and and it's just in, like that who now I like want to go behind like behind the scenes because like from my position too if you're expecting your host agency to give you like marketing materials or have resources like that then what are you doing to sell your own brand because people aren't buying the consortia they're not buying the host agency services they're buying your services Mm -hmm. So kind of like, it's almost a little bit of that may have been the way of things before, but that's not the way of things. Not saying that host agencies shouldn't also provide quality education on things like sales and marketing either at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's just really interesting to be able to ask people questions and get these answers and kind of look at the big trends. And it's, you know, our survey isn't it's it's not like I said it's a complicated survey it's not for mm -hmm. the person taking it you know they just get the questions right. but they are like in-depth questions right. and so we're just so grateful that so many people take the time to take the survey and like as a thank you what we make sure we do is that we give the report for free to people that take the survey that are mm -hmm. giving us and helping us out um, so that they can it's great for benchmarking Oh yeah, um, and if you're to be like, oh, I I really should be doing this. This is what the average is. Or if you're looking at your like one of the things, um, like if you're say looking at your fees and be like, wow, I'm charging a lot less than what other people are charging for this. Maybe I should think about mm -hmm. ra raising my fees. Or, um, oh, I hadn't like most people do their fees for consulting, um like they'll do it per person mm -hmm. and I do mine hourly. Maybe I should think about changing up that model or there's, you know, that we have, too. yeah, we have things in there about if it's a pay to go booking. And so, you know, you're, they're charging a fee, but then you're giving it back to the person. And then we ask, okay, if you are giving it back to your client, what percent are doing that? And then of those people that are giving it back, are they giving a certain percentage back or a certain amount back to the person? Do they keep some? So all that data is in there and it can just, I don't know, for me, it gets my wheels turning and, um, you know, has me thinking about things in different ways. Right. Well, and I think like that's, I, I was like, can you tell us the juicy real quick before we hop off of what are kind of like the average fees that people are charging? Yeah, let me pull it up really quick because people seem to think I have a great memory and that I actually remember <laughs> all the numbers in this report. And if you have looked at the report, you know there are hundreds and hundreds of stats in oh, here. Oh so. my goodness. I can't imagine. I haven't seen it just yet. Oh uh, my gosh. But I, I love where you say that it's like a really great benchmark because I think like that's one of the taboo things. Still, mm -hmm. I think just in society, like nobody talks about how much they make, but especially like in the travel industry, like it's not widely said, like I charge X fee for this and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, when we first started, it was really hard too, because there was no data for it. Like people need to know when you become a travel advisor and you're independent contractor and you're not an employee, you're not going to be making a living your first year, most likely. Yeah. You're going to either have to, like, and that's something that's important to tell people to be successful. Right. And we weren't doing that. And right. so it's it's important, like, if we want to set people up for success, we got to tell them what to expect. Right. 
So um, let's see. Um, well, we it's like 10 pages on fees and breaking them down. <laughs> so I'll just, we're going to stick. Okay, so I'll let you choose here, Rita. We can talk about service fees or we can talk about consultation fees. Which one do you want to talk about? Oh, let's do consult fees then. Okay. So consultation fees, we ask like, um, what type of consultation fees do they charge? So are they doing a flat fee per person or hourly? Mm -hmm. And so the vast majority do flat fees and that that's 84% yeah. um, per, per person, 15% and hourly is 4%. Okay. And then we kind of break it down. So each of those three types, we'll break it down. Um, we'll ask what was the median like flat fee. So $100 was what most people were charging for their flat fee. Okay. Um, but 64% did a variable flat fee, which means if, um, you know, based on the number of people or the number of days you're staying, things like right. that. Um. And then let me see what else we've gotten here. So then we also like talked about the plan to go fees. So 22% uh -huh. um, of advisors that charged fees, they applied, they did some sort of, they 22% of advisors that charge fees, they applied um, part or some of that fee to the client's trip. So okay. this is surprising that 80%, um, the full fee, fee is applied back to the booking, which was higher than I thought. Um, and then, mm -hmm, and then 12%, they give a certain dollar amount um, back to the advisor. And then the most common amount that they gave back was $50. And then 8% did a certain percentage back to uh -huh. the consumer. And that was 50% of the consultation fee they gave back. So Okay. I am one for not giving back the fee, but I can understand in the beginning, like how it's comfortable. I think it's, it's a nice, yeah. It's like a nice way to out. ease people into it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And to like get rid of people that may be wasting your time. So exactly. Cause that's what I hear is the most frustrating for newbies and just for everybody in general is that when you've like invested all this time and then they go and book it on their own somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And it's a, it's a challenge. I think nearly every new travel advisor I've talked to struggles with that where they're, they learn their lesson though, very right. quickly. Like I spent so much time on that booking and the person just ran. Oh Yeah. So. Yeah, I I just think that's the we've entered like I guess the 21st century in modern travel planning that it's just natural and normal. And I'll see in all these places like what it shouldn't cost you anything to work with a travel advisor and being like, well, it doesn't have to. You can just like book it on your own. But if you're gonna yeah. be working for a professional, that's totally different. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, I always have fun with you. So thank you for your time here today. How can people learn more about host agency reviews and maybe even check out that survey? Yes. So survey opens. Um, we open it like right after taxes are due every year. So in April of every year, but you can go to hostagencyreviews.com slash survey and sign up for survey reminders so that you can get the email um, and get signed up for our newsletter list. And um, at hostagencyreviews.com, you can uh, get all your learning on. There's an events calendar that has hundreds, well, maybe like 110 industry events within there. So it's really comprehensive. Um, there's, of course, the blog articles. You can look at the research report, the summaries that are on there. Um, and we have host week coming up in January, Yay! the last week in January. So um, that is super fun and is a great way for, we'll be going over number one, more of the survey uh, data that that's coming out. So we'll talk about that during host week. There's these education sessions that are, um, you know, Rita, you know, the speakers are going to be amazing. Rita oh, yeah. spoke last year. Um, On LinkedIn. So, <laughs> yep. So you can go to hostagencyreviews.com slash host week and sign up an RSVP for host week. It's free. And we'd love to see you there. Yes. And your pets. Oh, 
Yes, because <laughs> last year we had, I mean, I think he stole the show of a baby pig named Bacon. Someone sent in the picture and um, it was super cute. We were having people send in their their picture of their office pets that were keeping them company. And it was oh, just yeah. so adorable. It was the best. And like, yeah. especially after all the work, being able to see like, Furry and not furry friends is really nice too. I mean, who I did not envision a little baby mini pig. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> supposed to be so fan. <laughs> and his name is Bacon. Oh, cool. Well, there is so many more pets and stuff happening at host agency reviews. So make sure to check them out. I'll have some links at the bottom. Again, thank you, Steph, for being here and uh, hanging thank you out. Happy Wave Week, everybody. And thanks for having me, Rita. Thank you.